his appeal to uphold his travel ban. We go now to Fox News senior political analyst Britt Hume. Britt, what do you what do you, you think is likely to happen? What ought to happen? What do we make of this? Well, being in the it's the Ninth Circuit, you'd have to sort of guess that the the uh, judge's order will be upheld, and thus the pause on the immigration pause will remain in effect. Um, I, I must say, having listened to the argument, uh, that those judges got pretty far afield from the question before them, which was simply this. Did the president have the authority uh, under his constitutional duties to impose this temporary ban? And did the judge who ordered it uh, halted temporarily um, have the authority to do that? Uh, those are the questions, it seems to me. And before you know it, you know, they were judges were asking for evidence of danger from the countries involved. That's way beyond the purview, it seems right. to me, of this particular, uh, at, at this particular hearing, at this particular stage of this case. So you heard part of this exchange, we just played it with uh, Trace Gallagher, but the, the, uh, the lawyer speaking to the judge and saying, look, as to the question of intent, we know this was an intentional Muslim ban based on statements that the now president made during the campaign. Is that germane to the constitutional questions at the heart of this, do you think? I think it is utterly irrelevant to the constitutional question. I mean, it, it, I've never heard of such a thing being introduced into a case like this. Um, but this is, this is where those judges felt free to go. And this, of course, is very much in keeping with the reputation of the judges in that circuit court of appeals. They are famous uh, for getting outside the normal bounds of what judges should decide. And that's why they get slapped down so often by the, uh, by the Supreme Court. Which this is, is what they do. Which is the next stop uh, on this. And so that, that's the obvious follow-up. If the ban, if the pause, uh, the ban on the pause is upheld, um, does the, the pause on the ban or the ban the on the pause, pause either the way works, right? <laughs> if, the, if the travel ban is lifted, in effect, by uh, the, the Ninth Circuit, does, does it move inexorably to the Supreme Court after today? I, th I think this whole matter will eventually get before the Supreme Court, because remember, Tucker, we're dealing with preliminary motions here in this case. I mean, the purpose of the temporary restraining order, which the judge in Seattle imposed, was simply to freeze the status quo until the larger, the, the case itself, the underlying case, could be right. adjudicated. So either way, that case, it seems to me, whether the, whether the, whether the president's policy uh, restrictions go into effect or whether they are held in abeyance, those case, that case and other cases around the country will go forward, and it seems to me unless, uh, you know, unless court of, courts of appeals across the country completely slap down the plaintiffs in these cases, I think the matter is likely to end up before the Supreme Court so, uh, one way or the other. So here's a political question for you, and a distressing observation for me anyway. Where is the debate about the underlying principles here? How many people we ought to be allowing from this part of the world if people from this part of the world are uniquely threatening to us? What's our obligation to refugees and immigrants, et cetera? Is there going to be a public debate on those core questions at some point, do you think? Well, perhaps not in the context of this lawsuit, but you would think going forward there would be because this administration obviously plans to reform our immigration policies in such a way that they may more closely conform to, the, uh, to, the, to their view of the issue you were talking about earlier, which is what's in the best interest of the United States, not, right. what's in, not necessarily what's in the best interest of the United States image. Uh, in the world, but what's in the best interest of the United States in hard practical terms? In other words, who can contribute what to our economy? Who is likely to come here and help build the country? Who is likely to be successful? And th those are all the, uh, all the questions that would have to feed into a broader question of how you legislate now on immigration going forward. Yes, those, those seem like fair questions. All right, if you just stay right there for a sec, we're going to listen in to part of what each side argued today before the Ninth Circuit in court. First, this is the Trump administration side. Listen. May it please the court. I'm August Flengey with the Justice Department here on behalf of the United States. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. The executive order at issue puts a temporary pause on entry for individuals from seven countries that Congress and the last president determined in a similar context pose special risks in terms of terrorist infiltration into our country. Those determinations were made in 2015 and 2016 based either on a congressional determination or statutory factors including their foreign terrorist organizations had significant presence in the country or the country served as a safe haven for terrorists. The order also temporarily halted refugee program. This judgment was well within the president's power as delegated to him by Congress and it is constitutional as the court in Boston in Halal Kalam recently held. Under Section 212F, 
Congress has expressly authorized the president to suspend entry of classes of aliens when it is Debt, when it is necessary or when otherwise it would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. That's what the president did here. And the president's determination that a 90-day pause was needed for the seven countries at issue here in order to ensure adequate standards, and that's language from the order, for visa screening was plainly constitutional. The district's court's order, which contained no assessment of the legality of the order, was an error, and we encourage the court to stay. A key factor in the order and its temporary nature is the, was the president's determination that there was a need to review existing practices for screening foreign nationals who apply for visas. Okay, not a very dynamic picture, but an interesting argument. That was the administration side of things. Here's what the states had to say in response. Absolutely, Your Honor. Absolutely. The, the, the parties have agreed to a briefing schedule. The, uh, the preliminary injunction motion will be fully briefed by a week from Friday. Uh, I'm confident that Judge Robart will schedule, uh, will, will, rule, uh, will schedule a hearing and rule quickly after that. I'd also point out that the 14-day limit is for ex parte, uh, temporary restraining orders by its text. Uh, this one, no, it's part not. of the problem with, well, part of the problem with treating this as a temporary restraining order, Your Honor, is that if, 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 if the defendants are right that any time uh, the court enters a temporary restraining order after a hearing and, and receiving briefing, uh, it's treated as a preliminary injunction, that's, that's a terrible rule to create for district courts because it, it, it discourages them from hearing from the other side before entering a temporary restraining order. But, but, Your Honors, I do, I do certainly want to move on to the merits. I don't want to spend uh, all your time on this. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, the, if, if this is treated as a motion for stay, uh, we obviously still believe that the court should reject that motion. And, and the most simple basis for that, of course, would be the lack of irreparable harm. I heard Your Honors, again, pressing uh, counsel for a statement of what the irreparable harm is and still no clear um, factual claims or evidentiary claims of what that irreparable harm would be from a stay. And in fact, it was the executive order itself that caused irreparable harm to our states, to Washington and Minnesota and our residents, and to many other states and people, as, uh, as described in the many amicus briefs that have been filed. Uh, so, so of course, we believe that, that the federal government has shown no irreparable harm from reinstating the, uh, the status quo prior to the executive order. All right, there's a lot going on there. Everyone in those tapes passed the bar exam, so it's hard to decipher exactly uh, what they meant. So we're bringing in uh, the great Brit Hume uh, to translate for us. So you said at the outset something I, I think we should keep reminding ourselves of, which is the basic argument here is does the President of the United States have a constitutional uh, ability to do things like this, to control who comes in and out of the country? And does he historically? Does precedent support that? Well, it does, and not only that, there's legislation which you heard the government lawyer, the, the, the Justice Department lawyer, uh, refer to, which is a law that was passed in 1952, which has been repeatedly quoted by the government here, which gives the president the authority at any time to suspend immigration from any country or, or region or wherever he wishes if he believes it is in the national security of the United States for him to do right. so. That's not a quote, but that's the sense of it. Now, there was a subsequent law passed in 1965, which the, which the plaintiffs in this case have tried to rely on, which said you can't discriminate uh, based on uh, race, color, religion, nationality, and immigration policy. Um, that seems to me to be not quite in play here, uh, simply because this was a national security finding, and it is not the imposition of a policy. It is the imposition of a, of a pause in current immigration right. practice pending review to determine what new screening procedures might be adopted. So uh, I think that on legal terms, the government has the best of the argument. But having said that, I think that... I'm not a lawyer, but I've covered a lot of legal cases, and I've been a defendant in a couple. Um, and I, I, I think the government should win and will eventually prevail. The question is um, whether this should be allowed to go on this long um, right. with, the, with the, the president's national security order in advance. Well, that, that is the question. Now, all of this is an outgrowth of what uh, the president's opponents are calling a resistance to Donald Trump. Not opposition resistance. It sounds like something that de Gaulle led against Vichy. I mean, it's, they're, they're kind of framing this in martial, <laughs> in martial terms. What do you make of the resistance against Trump or to Trump? 
Well, a pit, well, I, the resistance in the country, I think, is 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 a function of the fact that he's viewed as like the antichrist um, by the left and some who are not on the left, not on the right. left. In Congress, I review this this all-out ban, this all-out resistance. Excuse me, as a function of the Democrats being in something like the same position that the Republicans were when President Obama was in office, and the Republicans got control of first the House and later the Senate. Their constituents, those who put, put them in office, or who, who believe felt they did, and they certainly contributed to it, thought that they were going to do all sorts of things to reverse That's Obama right. policies, that, that they'd be able to repeal Obamacare, that be, they'd be able to defund the government if necessary to stop uh, these, these policies from taking effect, and so on. As a political matter, it was much more difficult than they supposed. As we learned when the government got shut down in a fight over funding Obamacare and the public turned to an extent never before seen in the polling against the Republicans. Now, later on, of course, they prevailed in the election and everybody later said that, it was a, that the shutdown didn't hurt. It did hurt. But the problem for the Democrats is that they're in, even, in an even weaker position than the Republicans were because they control neither house of the Congress That's right. and, of course, not the White House. So their ability to resist effectively is diminished, and we found the ultimate example of that today. They really did all went, they went all out to stop Betsy DeVos. They, yeah, they killed did. off a couple of Republicans, and, and they ended up, in the end, Mike Pence cast the decisive vote, and Betsy DeVos tonight is the Secretary of Education. Well, that's, weakness is the key. I mean, extremism tends to grow from weakness rather than from strength. What I find so striking, though, is that even members of uh, the Democrats in the House, who we think of as kind of far out, avid lefties, I don't know, Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, they seem moderate uh, by comparison to a lot of Democratic voters right now. Do you get that impression? Well, I'm not sure they're moderate because, you know, Maxine Waters is already, you know, talking about when the time comes, she's going to move to impeach the president. Um, yes. She said that I maybe I don't I think it's in a somewhat different news conference from the one where she said that Russia invaded Korea. I think she meant Crimea. Um, but you know, with Maxine Waters, all sorts of things get said. But I think you know th those people are pretty far out there. But but you know, for, for the Democratic Caucus as a whole to be as as, as far out on these limbs uh, of resistance to Trump is something new and something we haven't quite seen before. And, uh, and the question, I mean, I think they feel they have to do it because they've got a, right. they've got a constituency that's, you know, really up in arms uh, and unable to adjust in, in any way to the fact that Trump is president. And they think they can strangle his presidency in its, in its crib. And they're trying to do that so far, not very effectively, but noisily. And, in, you know, as in the case of this lawsuit, I suppose you could argue that they've at least succeeded in stalling it to some extent. So I, I would say at least Maxine Waters is suggesting peaceful means, which puts her in a different category from a lot of the people who are voting for <laughs> well, her and yeah, writing on the them, Internet. Yeah. So, but where does, so they've got two years until there's any kind of election, until there's anything they can do electorally about the Republican lock on the federal government. So does this burn itself out, well, this it, rage, this intensity? Does it go away? Does it escalate? What happens between now and then? I think that's a $64 question, Tucker, whether this, you know, people simply get tired and after they've, you know, broken their pick on issue after issue after no nominee after nominee and perhaps policy after policy. Um, but, but look, the, the left, remember, Tucker, is the, par, is, the, is, the, is the branch of our polity that cares about government. Right. And they've lost control of government. And it means a lot more to them in a way than it, would, than it ever did to the right. Now, the right was mostly trying to get control of the government so they could slow it down. The right. left believes is the party of government. It's the Democrats are the party of government. And they're going to fight as hard as I think they think they have to fight in order to see if they can wrest control of it back. Because this is what they, this is their lifeblood. This is what they believe in. Uh, and, and it means more to them than it, than it does to anybody else. So I don't know. That, I can't see them uh, giving, up, giving up or giving in. They might wear out, but uh, I don't see them giving up. So, but what I sort of wonder with these confirmation hearings, and you're, you're going to see one tomorrow where Democrats are going to stay up all night to delay again the vote on the perspective of Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Do they get any victories in any of this? Any actual victories rather than just well, moral victories? I don't think, no, I don't, I think they don't get any actual victories, but I think they're, to their base and to their, to their most angry constituents, it, it, it may be satisfying somehow to see, you know, a temporary frustration of Jefferson Sessions, uh, ex, you know, becoming attorney general and the president getting his way on that. So they will, you know, they will block, stall, delay, complain, criticize, attack. Uh, and of course, their allies in the media who are legion uh, are part of the whole picture here. 
And so they're going to get a lot of help from that. It's, this is going to be a noisy and rancorous atmosphere, perhaps more than we've seen. And it's been pretty bad for some time, as you know, Tucker. But I think it's going to, it's going to be bad and, and perhaps worse for as far as the eye can see. So let me just ask you one last question. If, if you look at the groups arrayed against Trump, and by the way, I think there are things to criticize about the Trump administration. I'm not saying there aren't. But if you look at the professional agitators or opponents of the Trump administration, it really does look like the coalition of the privileged, actually. So it's Hollywood, it's the political class, the tech community. You, you know, it's people in upper income brackets. Have you ever seen anything like that before? It's a revolution from above, it looks like well, to me. Well, yeah, it's true. And, and the other thing is, Tucker, the Democratic Party for some time has been increasingly becoming the party of the very poor and the very rich. And what happened to them in, in this most recent election is that they lost that, you know, working class element that had been so important to their hold yeah. on states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, and, I mean, excuse me, Wisconsin and, and the other states out in the Midwest that they lost this time, which is what cost the presidency. So this is a party of the, the sort of the two income extremes now. And, you know, the Hollywood left, which has been getting more so all the time, is, is you know, is rabid on the subject of Trump. And, and I think that, the, you know, the African-American community uh, didn't support him, although they didn't turn out for Hillary in the way they did for Barack Obama. And that's right. part of the story of what happened here. But I think you're right about that. It's the top and the bottom. Is, is there the any scale. effort, so after the election, I remember talking to you about this, and we saw the industrial Midwest go to Trump against most expectations, and the thought at that point was, well, holy smokes, they've got to figure out a way to run people like Senator Casey or, you know, Democrats with a proven record of an appeal to the middle of the country, to the middle class. But you haven't seen, at least in public, efforts to figure out a program to appeal to those voters. Do you think they've given up on the middle class? Well, look at the... I well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think, Tucker, that if you look at the race for the chairmanship of the Democratic Party, it does not look like anybody's looking for a centrist. I no. mean, you know, what you have is left and left and lefter. Um, and, you know, look, the Democratic Party is nowhere near dead. It will come back. Of its course. moment will come again, maybe sooner than we think. But in the, for the near term, I think they're I think they're stuck without power. And, and an enraged constituency, which will encourage members of the party to carry out uh, actions which I don't think will be successful, which yeah. I think will only lead in turn to more frustration. And, and, you know, even though Donald Trump, as we've seen, gives them ammunition to fight with all the time, uh, they have not so far applied it very effectively. Yeah. Well, craziness, if that's craziness, and I hope it doesn't go to dark places. I really do. Britt, thanks a lot for joining us and for yeah, the, me too. the wise summation. You bet, Tucker.